Good morning, TCBC. Good to see everybody. Let's go ahead and get started with a question. The question is, how is your faith journey these days? Now, as a church, we've been together, oh gosh, about 23 months now. And we've got a number of highlights that we can uh, point back and look and see where God has been at work uh, in us. Uh, one of those is the trust building work of the reconciliation efforts that we partook in. Uh, we're also excited about the uh, unifying vision of pursuing Christ together. Uh, and also we're sitting on the edge of our seats uh, with spiritual and emotional momentum uh, building as we await the conclusion of our pastoral search process. And as I was looking around, maybe you guys were looking around at the beginning of the service, uh, our faces tell the story of Jesus uh, building resilient faith in all of us. And so it's no coincidence that I'm preaching on a, an expression of gathered faith in this season of scattered faith. And so uh, we're starting our new, our second uh, mini series. It's called Pursuing Christ Together in Mutual Participation. So this means we do this together. Uh, we believe together, we stand together. This morning, we're going to be reminded that, that faith, by necessity, has convictions that affect all of us. Faith-based convictions are life-changing. They're life-directing. And yes, sometimes they're life-threatening. Faith-based convictions are powerful. Faith-based convictions can have miraculous results, too. So please turn in your Bibles. We're in the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 3. And so we're going to look at this whole chapter. So we get a lot of scripture reading in this morning. And as you go there, this is the account of the gathered faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it's really not so much about a fiery furnace as it is about a faith on fire. It's about a faith on fire that can burn. It can suffer alone, but it chooses to burn. It chooses to suffer together. And it's the one who faced the fire for us that is with us in every fire. Jesus empowers us to choose him and burn together rather than bow before another. So let's start with the first seven verses of Daniel chapter three. I'll try to read through them quickly here. Uh, verse one, King Nebuchadnezzar, he made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth was six cubits. <clears throat> he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps and the prefects and the governors and the counselors, uh, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps and the prefects and the governors and the counselors and the treasurers and the justices and the magistrates, all the officials of all the provinces gathered for the dedication of that image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, you're commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn and the pipe and the lyre and the trigon and the harp and the bagpipe and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And everyone who does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the people heard the sound of the horn and the pipe and the lyre and the trigon and the harp and the bagpipe and every kind of music, all peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now, the broader context uh, for the book of Daniel is that an idolatrous nation uh, ruled most of the then known Eastern world. Uh, that nation is the Babylonian nation, and King Nebuchadnezzar rules. Uh, his armies, as those armies com conquered country after country, it was his practice to take the, the wisest, the, the most intelligent, the most skilled men 
of those nations and bring them to the capital city in Babylon. And rather than making them slaves, they'd be brought into this royal home and they'd eat the best foods and they'd wear the best clothes. They'd, they'd hang out with the king and when the king needed advice, he would gather these wise men for counsel. Around 605 BC, God allowed the southern tribes of the Jewish nation, Benjamin and Judah, to be taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar, disciplining them for their own idolatry. The Jewish men set apart by Nebuchadnezzar are Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, these guys are immersed. They are surrounded by the Babylonians who are ethnically and spiritually uh, diverse group. And God is allowing uh, these Jewish men to prosper in Babylon. In Daniel's chapter, Daniel chapters 1 and 2, Nebuchadnezzar recognizes there's something different with these four Jewish men. I mean, they're excelling beyond many of the other kind of homegrown government officials. So fast forwarding to Daniel chapter 3, the king's effort here is to unify, unify his diverse leaders of all these countries through singular worship. And that may very well be a wise step. I mean, he has so many different uh, cultures that he's conquered in his kingdom. I mean, he doesn't really know to, what to do with all of them and the leaders from those nations. I mean, he's got some who are worshiping Jehovah. He's got some who are worshiping Marduk and others worshiping this God and others worshiping that God. It's, it's an amazing mixture of cultures and beliefs. So Nebuchadnezzar basically says, okay, new rule. You know, you can worship who you want, believe what you want, but you need to make me the supreme authority in your life. That's basically what he's saying. And the people of that day would have had very little difficulty with that request. Many of them were polytheists, so they could easily add this golden idol to their list of gods. But Nebuchadnezzar is not exactly set up to be employer of the year because he's utilizing cremation as motivation for worshiping this golden image. Now, we don't know for sure, but the image could well be that of Nebuchadnezzar himself. As recorded in chapter 2, Daniel interpreted the dream that God gave the king in which the king himself was the, the head of a gold uh, giant statue. Maybe Nebuchadnezzar became kind of enamored with that and kind of fancied himself worthy as worship. It's, it's likely, but we just don't know for sure. Uh, the image was probably not solid gold, but kind of overlaid with it, uh, nor are its dimensions, which in our terms is about 90 feet high by nine, uh, nine feet wide. It's likely that that figure, the figure itself didn't have those dimensions, but the figure was probably still quite sizable, but it was stabilized on a very prominent stone base that elevated it, elevated that image you know, way up above the plain of Dura, magnificently gleaming, 90 feet tall. How awe-inspiring that must have been. I mean, even by itself, but certainly with this moving score of all these different instruments, it must have been nearly impossible to look away from it. I wonder about us today. Are there people, uh, possessions, places to live, positions of influence that uh, deeply and similarly capture our attention, our affection, our devotion? As a reminder, an idol is anything as or more important to you than God. An idol is anything that absorbs your heart and your imagination in a way that should only belong to God. An idol is anything you ask to provide for you what only God should give. Those are quotes from Tim Keller's excellent book, Counterfeit Gods. Uh, it's a very discerning book, and I highly recommend it. Uh, back to Daniel. Uh, we see the following drama unfold. Uh, verse 8, therefore at the time certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. 
uh, you, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn and the pipe and the lyre and the trigon and the harp and the bagpipe, every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now, about all we need to say here is, gee, thanks, Chaldeans. Uh, these guys were the, the homeboys from this region, and they've been there for at least 100 years. And they come to the king with flattery, flattery and say, hey, king, we voted for you. We worship you. You know, oh, employer of the year, live together, live forever. Uh, we love your plan to unify. But those contentious, those devices, divisive Jewish men over there, oh boy, did you see what they do, did? They ignored you, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, they want you to fail. Even with cremation for motivation, they defied you. What are you going to do with them now? That's basically what's happening here. Now, with that kind of a, a pep talk, let's see what the king does next. Verse 13, then Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you're ready, when you hear the sound of the horn and the pipe and the lyre and the trigon and the harp and the bagpipe with every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I've made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into the burning fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Wow. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar, he is white hot with anger. I mean, he's so inflamed, he foolishly pits his human authority against the delivering power of God himself. What do Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do? Well, they don't give him all that long live the king stuff. They simply say, O Nebuchadnezzar, we don't have a need to answer you in this matter. I love that succinctness, but what does it mean? Well, basically it means we don't have anything to say. And it isn't arrogant at all. It means we can't deny it. And we can't explain away this accusation. Nothing we could say would ever matter to you. And we'd be tempted to think, oh man, what an amazing amount of faith. What great expectation of deliverance. But we would be wrong. I paraphrase this as this. Faith is not powerful trust in an outcome, but simple trust in the sovereign one. It's about God, not us. The New Testament echoes this too. In fact, Jesus rarely talks about the faith of his followers in terms of them needing great faith or, or powerful faith. Most often he says things like this, for truly I say to you, if you have the faith like the grain of a mustard seed, You'll say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Jesus' point there is simply that just a little faith in a good and sovereign God is sufficient. Now, since faith is core to our message, uh, let me summarize a couple misconceptions that we could have about faith. Uh, Brian Chappell expands on uh, what I said, noting that biblical faith is not confidence in a particular outcome, it's confidence in a good and sovereign 
God, regardless of outcomes. Additionally, our trust, it's not based on the quantity or quality of our belief. Faith is not confidence in our belief, but confidence in our God. So let's look at what biblical faith is not. Two things biblical faith is not. First, biblical faith is not trust in the quantity of our belief. Here's what I mean. Faith is not pouring as much confidence as we can into our minds and draining as much doubt as we can from our hearts in order to get what we want. Biblical faith is not an exercise in psyching ourselves up mentally or emotionally. Secondly, biblical faith is not trusting in the quality of our belief. Now, that error says a God will fulfill our desires because of how good our belief is. Uh, here we would expect God to kind of come through because we determined that what we want to have happen is in God's best interest to make it happen. Because the results are for this high quality of God's sake, we become convinced that uh, we would love to have that happen. What we would love to have happen has got to occur. Biblical faith is trust in God, his plan. Faith does not require God to fulfill even our honorably inspired wishes as though our desires were God's command. God knows what's necessary. He knows when it's necessary and how to do it. We don't. Let me ask you another question. Have you made up your mind? Have you made up your mind about moral and ethical issues? In any area of your life, have you made up your mind that regardless of the consequences, you will not compromise? See, God's not out looking for influential people that he can make faithful. God is looking for faithful people that he can elevate to positions of influence. And there's a difference to that. And we see that in Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. These three men looked at themselves. They looked around and thought, man, nobody has got a clue. But God, we know you. You see, this situation, although certainly more extreme and rare than what we experience on a daily basis, it clarifies something for us. First, as believers, uh, as gathered believers at TCBC, we are in this life of faith together. Amen? Oh, I think we missed an opportunity. TCBC, we're in this together. Amen? Yeah, that's better. Secondly, what we do together, it's not aimed at self-preservation for earthly comfort, but rather self-sacrifice for our eternal Savior and those that he's called us to reach. Now, that's not intended to be insulting because we've all been there, right? I mean, haven't we all been through times where the future was pretty undetermined and our provision was uncertain? And with this pandemic, I mean, aren't we all in that kind of a season right now, at least to some extent? See, God's looking at us now as we live in a worldly culture that desires to control our hearts and minds. He looks at us just as he looked at those three Jewish leaders in an idolatrous culture. He's looking at us for us to say to him, here we stand, God. We've made up our minds and our lives are in your hands. Deliver us or not, we will not bow before another. Nebuchadnezzar had tried to control their hearts and minds, but their faith is on fire, and it looks like their bodies are going to be on fire soon, too. Now, they stood together. Now, they would not bow to another. Their faith echoes Job's, who amidst his own suffering said of God, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Well, Nebuchadnezzar, he follows through on his threat in these next few verses, starting in verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury and the expression of his face changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace be heated up seven times more than it uh, usually is heated. 
And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these, men's were, uh, then these men were bound in their cloaks and their tunics and their hats and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. True to form and his promise, the king heated the furnace up as hot as it could go and then some. Now, there's not a lot of detail about the furnace and its setting, so we have to read between the lines a little bit here. It's likely that the furnace was probably dug down into the ground with maybe a broad uh, opening, top opening up to the sky. And there probably was another opening near the base of this furnace in order to, to fuel and stoke the fire. Since Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were tightly bound and thrown into the fire, it's likely that this was done maybe from the top. And then those that were charged with doing so uh, were overwhelmed by the heat and died because the king made sure there would be no earthly escape from the furnace. But then something happened that maybe nobody expected. The undeliverable were delivered. Verse 24, then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. He rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did, not, did we not cast three men uh, bound into the fire? And they answered and said, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps and the prefects and the governors and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. No smell of fire had come upon them. Now that had to be, <coughs> excuse me, quite a scene, don't you think? And for the sake of time, I've got to be quick. Uh, astonishment overtook Nebuchadnezzar because everything he did to destroy those who defied him was being undone. We can't be sure, but it's likely that in the furnace, along with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is the pre-incarnate Jesus. Whether it was an angel or Jesus, we can't be sure, but the king knows the fourth man is not of this world, and now he knows something else. He knows that though Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are under his employ, more importantly, now he knows they are faithful servants of the Most High God. Now, as I wrap this up, I, I wonder what the rest of these three men's lives were like. I mean, we really don't know. I mean, we never hear from them again in Scripture. Uh, earlier in my introduction, I said, faith by necessity uh, has convictions that affect us all. Uh, commenting on Daniel chapter 3, John Ortberg ponders this question. He says, I wonder if these, ever, if these guys ever thought how easily they might have missed this adventure? I think that's a great question because if they had given in to fear, I mean, one word, one bent knee, they would have missed the greatest encounter, standing together with God in the furnace. I wonder if uh, when uh, they're old men, Years and years later, on the anniversary of this date, would they get together and remember? Maybe they would. Maybe they remember when, that when they were young men, uh, full of courage and faith, when they defied the king and walked around in the flames and spent a few moments in the physical presence of the living God. 
I bet they never forgot that. I mean, have you ever spent time in the furnace? Have you ever trust God enough to go to the place that looks like the end and you meet him there? It's going to mark you. You're going to carry that with you as long as you live. Going into the furnace? I mean, what looked like the last thing that they wanted to do turned out to be the greatest event of their lives. Ironically, the furnace that looked like death turned out to be the safest place of all. Why? Well, because God was there with them. Sometimes God delivers people from the flames, but sometimes God delivers in the flames. And those are the greatest times of our lives. Applications for us could be something like this. Maybe we no longer bow down to idols that uh, we've already allowed in our lives. Uh, maybe we no longer toy with temptations that we're susceptible to. Maybe we, uh, we quit bowing down to the threats and the compromises in living out our faith. Or from a positive perspective, maybe we stand up for the gospel, courageously living it out together. Uh, we commit to think and pray and pursue these because there's a great danger. Uh, there's a danger for the followers of Christ living in our America and our often comfortable world. The danger for us may be that the primary goal of our life becomes flame avoidance. With that goal, we pray things like, God, deliver me from pain. Uh, deliver me from discomfort or suffering or inconvenience. Make my life smooth. Make my life easy. Make it pleasant. Remove obstacles from my life. Again, we need to ask ourselves, who or what are we tempted to bow before? That idol of self looms high and it shines brightly these days. And the world feeds our sin nature, telling us that our American dreams, ah, they're as good as dead unless we bow down to a big house or, and a beautiful spouse and a job to die for. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, uh, their gathered faith in our God who is able to deliver stood head and shoulders above this eight-story high golden statue. Uh, their oneness of faith reflected the Son of God more brightly than that golden image reflected the noonday sun. Their indivisible faith withstood the fiery furnace that would have melted that idol into a puddle of yellow goo. You see, almost 3,000 years ago, the fire on the plain of Dura was intended by evil men to destroy their faith and end their life, but only serve to declare their faith and lead others to eternal life. More importantly, this points to another event about 600 years after that. The cross on the hill of Golgotha was intended by the evil one for Jesus' destruction, but through faith, it only serves as a sacrifice for eternal life for all who would believe. The high point of this is right at the end, Daniel 3. Don't miss it. It's not the drama. It's the declaration. Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan king, no less, declares in verse 29 that the Most High God is worthy of praise and honor and glory. And if you don't give him glory, you're going to be ruined. Why? Because as he said, there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Remember my introduction? I said, there's one who faced the fire for us, and he is in our fires with us. There is no God who is able to rescue in this way. On the cross, Jesus faced the incinerating wrath of God as judgment for our sins. He took the fire of eternal judgment for us. True biblical faith acknowledges that God knows 
what he's doing and he knows that what he's doing is right because on the cross, he proved he loves us. That there is no other God who can deliver in this way. And for as long as he gives us breath amidst whatever challenges and suffering we face, regardless of whether he delivers us from the flames or in the flames or maybe beyond the flames, out of loving gratitude, TCBC, let's stand, all of us, with Jesus together and bow and, and never bow before another. Let's pray. Father, as we have looked into your word, we recognize that uh, there, there is so much that goes on around us that distracts us from you. And while many of us here in the United States, are, are, our lives are not at risk, at least physically not at risk, uh, for living our faith courageously before, um, in some places there are. There are men and women uh, in prison. There are men and women who uh, suffer for boldly living out the faith uh, that you have instilled in them and that you inspire in them and that you make resilient. Father, we pray for your intervention in their lives and we pray for your intervention in our lives that we would not be distracted, that we would not take the, the good gifts that you give us and make them more or desire them more than we desire you. But we entrust ourselves to you, Father. Um, help us to be courageous. Help us to live faithfully, regardless of our circumstances and regardless of whether you deliver in the midst or not. And we ask all that in Christ's name. Amen.